الحمد للہ و صلاۃ وسلام علیہ رسول اللہ و اعلیٰ علیہ وصحاب اجمعین مابید و نعود باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ربش رحلی صدری و یسلی عمری وحل العقد تمل ثانی یفقہ ہو خولی مائی ڈیئر بردرس اینڈ مائی ڈیئر سسٹرس ان اسلام آئی ویلکم اینڈ گریٹ آل آف یو ود اسلامک گریٹنگ آف السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ May peace, blessings and mercy of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon each single one of you. My name is Sabeel Ahmed and uh, I came two days ago from USA, Chicago. And it's an honor for me to be here and it's an honor for me to be taking up this stage to give a bayan on a very important topic. The topic of da'wa. Sharing the message of Islam with our fellow Norwegians over here. with our fellow non-Muslims. Inshallah, I'm going to divide my bayan into three different, three different sub-settings. Number one, I will relate from the Quran and the Sunnah, Inshallah, that what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say about da'wah and its importance. Second important thing that I would like to relate in my bayan is some of the misconceptions, misunderstandings that people have there about Islam and Muslims. And the third, the most important part is some of the action items that we Muslims could take back with us. What can we do? What are the practical projects, both individually and as collectively? What can we do, inshallah? I was born and raised in India, Hyderabad. As I was growing up, there were many Hindu temples almost in every block, every corner, every street. They used to have many, many gods that they used to worship. But Alhamdulillah, there were many masajids, there were many Muslims. So I found out as I was growing up in India that there were no less than 100 million Muslims in India. Alhamdulillah. Then later on, I started to go to school in higher grades. I found out that, alhamdulillah, there are billions of Muslims all around the world. May that be in Africa, in Australia, in Europe, in parts of Russia, and obviously in the Middle East. So I started to think that I knew that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he was born in Mecca and he moved to Medina and he established the Islamic State in the, in the city of Medina. If the companions of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, if they lived up there and they passed away up there, how did Islam came to India, Pakistan, Somalia, Africa, all of these different regions? And I knew that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he was the last prophet and the last messenger, because the Quran testifies to it. It says in Surah Ahzab, chapter 33, verse number 40, that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he is the seal of the prophet. That means no new prophet and no new messenger is to come. And I knew from Surah Maida chapter 5 verse number 3 that Islam is the final, the complete and the universal faith. That means there is no other religion and there is no other prophet used to come. Then how come we have Muslims in all of these different parts of the world? Then I found out through my history classes that Alhamdulillah, there were some Muslims who came out of Medina, out of Mecca, and out of the Middle East, and they came to the different parts of the world. And they conveyed the message of Islam to my ancestors and to your ancestors, Alhamdulillah. My ancestors being born and raised in India, they were Hindus, they were Hindus. But someone came from outside of India and Pakistan and told them about Islam by their good conduct, by their good interaction, by being, by being them being exemplary Muslims. Those were the things that affected my ancestors and your ancestors. And Alhamdulillah, our ancestors, they proclaimed Islam, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. And because of that, now we could say, I could say, and you could say that you are a Muslim. Alhamdulillah. So what was the motivational factor for those ancestors, those companions of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that they left their land, their culture, their society, sometimes their families, sometimes their uh, environment, their houses, their property, to go to a different land? 
what was the motivational factor for them? Their motivational factor was, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, was the Quran and the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When they read the pages of the Quran, they found out that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has given a job description to each single Muslim. We all know the five pillars of Islam, the Shahada, praying five times a day, Zakat, right, fasting and Hajj. We all know this and we believe in it and we implement this. But besides the five pillars, there are other things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us as a job description. Now all of you, some of you may be working somewhere, right? Maybe in the IT field, maybe as a cab driver, maybe as a doctor, as a lawyer. You are working somewhere. When you are working, there is some job description that your boss gives to you. There is certain assignment. Same thing with the children, the youth over here. When you are going to school, there is certain assignment, there is certain job description, certain quizzes, certain homework that you are supposed to do. So in the same way, our boss, our creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us Muslims a job description. So besides the five pillars, the job description, one of the important ones that we have to fulfill is sharing the message of Islam with our fellow non-Muslims out there, alhamdulillah. So it says in the Quran, in chapter number 16, verse number 125, that call all to the way of your Lord with wisdom and fair preaching and interact with them in the ways which are best and most gracious. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not just saying that it's an option for us to share Islam. It's not just saying that it's a good thing for us to share Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding us. It's a commandment. It's an obligation. It's not an option. Not just for me, not just for you, but for all of the Muslim ummah. Alhamdulillah. Besides that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentions in Surah Fusilat, chapter 41, verse number 33, that who is better in speech than the one who invites people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You know, in our daily lives, when we are conversing, when we are speaking with our families, maybe we are speaking about some household things, maybe about, you know, family obligations, maybe about, you know, cooking, the dinner, maybe about how the kids are doing, all of those things. When we are at work, maybe we converse with the colleagues about the job assignment. When we are with our neighbors, with our friends, maybe about cricket and soccer and about movies and politics and economy. There are so many things that we speak each single day. But in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the best speech that comes from the mouth of a person is the speech of conveying Islam to a non-Muslim. Look at the honor, the prestige that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to a person who is conveying Islam and inviting humanity to worship none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when the companions of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when they looked at the example, the life, the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they found out from the initial time that he received the revelation of the Quran up until he passed away, he was conveying Islam day in and day out. Sometimes he used to invite his relatives and non-Muslims to dinner and for meal and convey Islam to them. Some other times he used to climb up to the mountain and he used to call people, he used to warn people and convey the message that way. Some other times when the tribes used to come for their hush, for the pagan hush, he used to run up to them and tell them about Islam. And some other time, he went to the different cities around Arabia and conveyed the message of Islam. So when the companions of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Sahaba, when they saw the pages of the Quran, the commandments in the Quran, and the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they knew that Islam is not restricted to Makkah or Medina or to Arabia. It was meant for all of mankind. And they made sure by their money, by their finances, and by their, by their uh, manpower, by their time, that they make their utmost obligation to take Islam to different parts of the world. But when they went there, it was not easy for them. 
They used to be superpowers at that time. May that be the Roman powers, may that be the Byzantine, may that be the Persian power. All of these powers displaced many barriers in front of the Sahaba from them to reach the common people with the message of Islam. But Alhamdulillah, they overcome those barriers and some of them, they had to give their lives. They sacrificed their lives. They became the shuhada. The process of conveying Islam. So because of their sacrifice and their work, now today that we could say, Alhamdulillah, we are Muslims. 100,000 Muslims in Norway, 11 million Muslims in USA, 133 million Muslims in China, 70 million Muslims in Egypt. In India, 150 million Muslims. In, in Pakistan, 160 million Muslims. In Bangladesh, about 70 million Muslims. In Indonesia, 200 million Muslims. Alhamdulillah, it is because of their sacrifices. When we came to Norway over here, or some of you who are born and raised over here, when your parents, when they came to Norway, they did not have to fight any battle. Maybe just the immigration battle, correct? Correct? However, not the battles that they fought up there. We came in the plane, eating halal food, right? Watching those entertainment systems in front of our seats. We came in air-conditioned plane over here. You may have came here to have a better life. You may have came here to, to, to get more wealth. You may have came here to get education and to raise your families. But the primary obligation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent you and me over here in Norway is because we become ambassadors of Islam. That we become ambassadors of Islam. That is the primary mission that we are here. That is the very primary mission that we are here, just like all the Anbiya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? All the Anbiya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their primary mission was to convey Tawheed and invite people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as we are living over here, Unfortunately, we as a Muslim Ummah, we are not fulfilling our mission. We are not conveying the message of Islam effectively the way it is supposed to be conveyed. Why do I say this? I say this because if you go and survey the non-Muslim population out there, and if, if you ask them the question, and they have asked this question in the USA, by the way, they ask this question in the USA that of all the different religions in the world, which one is more prone to violence, more prone to extremism, more prone to uh, fanaticism, and more prone to terrorism? The faith that stood out as number one, unfortunately, is the religion of peace, the religion of Islam. Unfortunately, that is the reality up there. So I take the example or the analogy of us Muslims to the analogy of a doctor. Okay? My field is medicine, by the way. So I take the analogy of a doctor to suppose if you know a doctor, a physician, he goes to a patient, he goes to the room, and he examines the patient. Right? He examines the patient, and he knows that what is wrong with the patient, what is the diagnosis, what is the disease with the patient. And suppose if the doctor has a prescription pad, he has the medicine with him. Instead of giving the medicine, suppose he comes out of the room and goes to the next room. Does the same thing again, examines the patient and knows what is wrong with the patient, but without giving him or her the medicine. Goes to the next room, the next room, and then comes back home. And does the same thing over and over again. What would you call the doctor? He should be getting a raise, he should be called the doctor of the month, the doctor of the year, a, a, uh, he should be given the Nobel Prize for medicine, or he should be fired right away. Correct? Right? He should be fired because he knows, he has in his hand, in his knowledge, the medicine, the treatment for the patient, and he's not giving the treatment. Us Muslims, when we look at the society, there are so many problems out there. Maybe the problem of divorce, guns, gangs, drugs, assaults, rapes, homicide, suicide, depression. All of these problems are out there. And Islam, alhamdulillah, 
we have the solution in the Quran and in the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But the biggest problem that this society and the Western society that they're facing through right now is none of those problems, by the way. It's none of those problems. The biggest problem, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, is the problem of shirk. Associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the form of saying that a human being is God. Naud billah, Isa alayhi salam. Or they're saying like Hindus do, that they have multiple gods. May the Rama, Krishna, Ganesh, all of those gods, idols. Or may that be some atheists, they are worshipping money and name and fame as being gods. So they are worshipping someone along with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or instead of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But they are committing shirk, one way, shape or form. But we have the solution for shirk and the solution is La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah Tawheed. So we are like that doctor. We have the solution, we have the prescription, we have the treatment that could cure the problems of the society. We interact with our friends, our non-Muslim friends. We work with our non-Muslim friends for many, many months and years sometimes. We have non-Muslim neighbors that we live with them for many, many years. Our classmates, our professors, our staff in the schools and colleges, they are non-Muslim. So we interact with them and we are free to discuss with them about politics and sports and all of these things. But when it comes to discussing about Islam, we shy away. Right? We shy away. We don't convey to them the solutions. We don't convey to them by accepting Islam the benefit that they will get, not just in this life, the eternal life, inshallah, the immense benefit of paradise. We don't do that. Because we are not doing that, unfortunately, there are many, many misconceptions that they have. And because of those misconceptions, unfortunately, they are making many laws against Islam and Muslims and us practicing Islam. What are some of the laws? I was doing some research on the internet about some of the laws that they are passing or about to pass here in Norway. There is a party called the Party of Animals, right? It's called the Party of Animals and they want to ban the halal slaughtering of animals in Norway here. How, man, how many of you knew that? Some of you, right? Correct. There is a party over here that would like to ban circumcision of you know, boys, males, babies. There are other groups all around the world which have either banned or banning the hijab, the niqab. They are banning the minarets. They are banning the expansion of the masajids. They are banning the practices that we Muslims take it for granted and that is part of our faith. They are doing this, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, is because they have misconceptions. They have misconceptions. When they, when they associate Islam with terrorism, when they associate the hijab with subjugation, right? when, the, when they associate the beard with terrorism, all of those things are misconceptions because they are watching CNN, they are watching Fox, they are watching all of those channels and they are getting the message of Islam from there, but we as Muslims, we are mostly silent. Despite the fact that we are 100,000 Muslims, alhamdulillah, in Norway over here. And all around the world, we have 1.5 billion Muslims and growing, alhamdulillah. So what is the solution? You know, any person, any khatib, any bayan, we should not just talk about problems. We should not make people gloomy and sad and depressed. Because Islam is a, is a, is a faith of action. Because Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he was a person of action. He was not a reactionary. He's a he's a person who was optimistic. So, what are some of the things that they think about Islam? And I'm going to go over three or four of those, inshallah, based on the time that we have. Then I will give an action plan from myself to each single one of you, inshallah. So, the three misconceptions that they have about Islam and Muslims is the top number one. The topmost one is jihad equals terrorism. You know, in the USA, we have a telephone number. 
that anyone, any non-Muslim could call that number and they could speak about Islam. They could have questions and answers about Islam. If they need any free literature, we send it to them. Alhamdulillah, in the last two years, we had 22,000 people calling that number, asking questions about Islam, obtaining free Quran. So the top question that people ask in the USA, and I think it may be same over here, is that Islam or or jihad equals terrorism. Obviously, if this is a misconception, that means we as Muslims have an obligation to explain to them. So the way that I explain to them is, jihad does not mean holy war. Holy war in Islam, there is a term. It's called harb muqaddasa. Now this term, harb muqaddasa, it does not occur in the Quran at all. The word holy war or its translation in the uh, its translation in, in Arabic, it does not occur at all. Zero times. There are 52,000 hadith literature that we have. If you scan all of them, this term occurs zero time. We have classical literature or the tafasir of the Quran, all the translations of the Quran, in all the 1400 years, this term occurs zero times. This term was originally invented when the Crusaders, way back in 1099, when they came to conquer Jerusalem and different parts of the world, they were the ones that used the word holy war. So it was invented by them and it was used by them, the Christians, the Catholics and the Protestants. So what I do is explain to them that jihad, it means a struggle. It has three different components to it. Component number one is jihad of the nafs. Two, enhance ourselves. If we are doing something wrong, if we have the temptation to overeat, and if we are being patient and not overeating, we are doing jihad. If a sister is wearing hijab out there, knowing the fact that they may ridicule her, they may call her names, but she's still doing that. That means she's fighting the temptations and trying, she's trying to be the best Muslimah out there. She's doing jihad. If you wake up in the morning in the cold Norwegian night and go to work fighting the traffic, you are doing jihad. If you have parents and if you're taking care of parents who may be old, you are doing jihad. If you are giving some, some, some dollars or Norwegian dollars, the crowns, right, over here, to person who is needy and people uh, and the person who needs help, you are doing jihad because you don't want to part with your money, but you are parting with your money. So that's jihad in your personal sense. The second form of jihad is mentioned in chapter number three, Surah Ali Imran, verse number 110, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat linnas ta'muruna bil ma'roof wa tanhawna anil munkar wa tu'minuna billah and the verse continues that you are the best of ummah created for mankind that you enjoin good and you forbid evil and you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that means to enjoin good and forbid evil from the society is also one form of jihad a third form of jihad which is mostly the media is after is the jihad of taking up arms. Taking up arms to defend ourselves. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse number 190. Why don't you fight in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? For those who fight against you. But do not transgress the limits set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are the three forms of jihad that are there in the Quran and the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the way that we should explain to them is, Islam tells us to exhaust all the diplomatic means, all the peaceful means. But if they do not agree with that, that Islam has given us, God has given us a right to take up arms, to defend ourselves, to defend our property, to defend our families. And even in that just war, not a holy war by the way, even in that just war, there are certain parameters that Islam wants us to live by. Parameter number one, it says in, uh, it says in Bukhari, Abdullah ibn Masood and Umar, bin, uh, and Umar uh, Abdullah ibn Umar, he mentioned that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa after one of his battles, he saw a woman laying on the ground and she was killed in the battle, right? So he called his companions, his sahaba, and he told them, 
even in a war even in a just war do not kill women and children and that is islam and that is islam it also is part of the quran it's part of the islam that you're not supposed to destroy any synagogues any churches any temples or any places where people are worshiping number 2 Number three, it's very important that there is no carpet bombing in Islam. That means there is no Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Islam. You cannot drop bombs on a civilian population. That means you cannot damage their water resources, you cannot damage their telephone resources, you cannot damage the resources of the common people of the enemy that they're using. and last but not the least if the enemy says peace if they drop their weapons you're also supposed to drop your weapons you cannot shoot them in the back and that is islam so if some people if some muslims are not obeying by this it is because of their shortcoming their misunderstanding their ignorance their lack of education it's not because of islam so we should tell to our non muslim that just like there are some christians who are raping committing crimes doing the crusaders doing the inquisition the colonial powers the slavery all of these humongous crimes against uh, against the society are we going to relate them to christianity obviously not in the same way it is not fair for a christian or a non muslim to associate islam with the actions of a few ignorant muslims so we separate the actions of the muslims with the pure teachings of islam where islam says that taking one life is like taking the life of all of humanity and that is islam so if we explain to them in this way separating the actions and bringing them to what islam says and then you recite the verses of the quran and saying the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam inshallah they will understand second or one of the misunderstanding that the non muslims have is about the word allah or allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we say the word allah they think the non muslims that we are speaking about a foreign god a god of the muslims a god of the arabs a god of the middle east maybe a moon god right these are some of the things that they say so we should tell them that in each language there are certain words there are certain term for the creator english language is the word god the god in norwegian language it is god correct in um, spanish language it is dios in hebrew language it is elohim or yahweh so these are all the words that signifies the creator the god the sustainer the everlasting the first and the last the loving the merciful so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the word allah means the god in english language it does not mean all of those negative things that they think of but this word is very important that isa alaihi salam his language was not english not norwegian not greek his language was hebrew and aramaic according to encyclopedia britannica The word for God in Aramaic language is Allah. So if you approach Isa alayhi salam when he comes back in his second coming and say that do you believe in God he would say what do you mean by God? Right? He will not understand the word God but if you say the word Allah or Allah he would say yes that is my Allah he is the one that I worship. <clears throat> So it's very important that we need to know the background of their people their culture and we should introduce Islam in that way last but not the least about the word Allah itself they have translated the bible into arabic and greek and different languages in the arabic language the word for god is allah right i have read the arabic bible by the way in the very first chapter which is a chapter of genesis Chapter 1 verse number 1 it says in the beginning Allah created the heavens and the earth when the christians and the jews whose tongue is arabic when they have to pray in the churches and the synagogue they use the word allah when they are writing letters to their friend when they are writing books in arabic when they are conversing with their arab friends the jews and the christians they use the word allah 
So when we explain to them in this way, inshallah, they would understand that Allah is not a foreign God. It is the God who created each single one of us, all of humanity and all of creation. In the next 10 minutes, inshallah, I will just go over some of the action items. And that is the most important thing that I personally would like to have all of you take away with you, inshallah. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes in the Quran, in Surah Ahzab, chapter 33, verse number 21, that he is the best example for each single one of us to follow. When we look at his exemplary nature, we find out that he is been maybe in a school, maybe with our neighbors. If each single one of us become exemplary Muslims, being the best neighbor, the best student, the best colleague, the best employee, the best employer, the best human being, inshallah, that is going to have a profound effect on the non-Muslims who are working with us. For example, I used to work in the hospital. In our department, there were many non-Muslims, about five, six Muslims and many non-Muslims. Over there, alhamdulillah, we made sure that we used to come on time, treat the patients on time, give them the best prescription, and help out those people who needed help in the hospital. So the comments that we used to receive from the non-Muslim, the staff of the hospital was, we know that the media is trying to show all of these negative things about Islam, but we see you Muslims, you are exemplary Muslims. We believe you, what we see, compared to what we hear in the media. That is the thing that we need to create at our work, in our schools and colleges, and in our neighborhood. So even if we affect 10 people in one year, those 10 people, non-Muslims, they may tell their families, their friends, their neighbors, that. You know what you're seeing about Islam in, uh, or Muslims in CNN? That's not true. I know Muslims. They are good people, good employees and good neighbors. Action, number, uh, action item number two. It is very important because of the humongous nature of the problem. Each single person has to commit at least two hours to four hours of outreach, conveying Islam, becoming exemplary Muslims in the society by different projects. But it's very important that they should be some full-time people. They should be some full-time Muslim activist in the society. I could give you the example of USA. In the USA, the Catholic denomination, right, the Catholic faith up there, they produce 50,000 full-time missionaries, 50,000 of them. And they send them to the Muslim nations to convey the gospel, the Christianity to the Muslims. May that be to Indonesia, to the Middle East, to Africa, to India and Pakistan. They're sending them so they could convert the Muslims. And these 50,000 people, they leave their profession, right? They leave the luxuries of their life. They leave the country, their culture, and they go to different parts of the land, living in small houses, conveying the message of Christianity. If they could do it, why not us, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam? So in Norway, there should be some people who should sacrifice and become full-time du'at, full-time da'is, inshallah. An example of some of the full-time da'is that we have, Dr. Zakir Naik. Just imagine, suppose if he was working full-time as a physician and spending maybe two, three, four hours for da'wah, do you think what he's doing right now would have been as effective if he was working full-time as a physician? Obviously not. Sheikh Ahmad Didad, who was the teacher of Zakir Naik, again, very profound effect. Brother Yusuf Estes, who was here, I believe, right, recently. Sheikh Khaled Yaseen, Dr. Bilal Phillips, Brother Abdul Rahim Green. These are all full-time Islamic workers. 
in the field of dawa and because they're doing it full time look at the profound influence that they're having inshallah so we just not we just don't need 10 people 15 people we need hundreds of people who are committed we only have one life to live right no more two lives three lives seven lives one life to live the what the way that we live in this life inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to determine where we are going to go to the lowest level of paradise or to the highest level of paradise so that's action plan number two that produce some full-time dua over here inshallah action item number three it's very important that the problems which are here in Norway we have to find out what kind of solutions that we could apply from the Quran and the Sunnah to these problems I heard that Norway is the only country that has a full-time hospital for people to uh, for people to get their depression treated full-time depression hospital I, I haven't seen that in Chicago USA any other place if that is a problem then find solutions from the Quran and the Sunnah Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and write literature produce videos hand out pamphlets so we could take care of that problem the problem of drugs the problem of immorality right the problem of homelessness as I was coming over here we saw a long line of people and they were there so they could receive some food so that problem is here too right so we should produce those scholars those educationists who could write literature who could who could write uh, who could compose literature produce videos and audios so we could massively distribute them inshallah right so that's number three number four very important is that we as Muslims we should do mass campaigns mass campaigns for example take McDonald's McDonald's doesn't take out one simple brochure and have a table in some you know public place so people could come and find out about McDonald's no what they do is they place advertisement on television on the radio in the newspapers so we have to make sure that we place advertisement positive advertisement about Islam in all of those different places so alhamdulillah in Chicago New York and different places in the USA we started to produce advertisement on radio on television uh, on newspapers and all on buses and billboards alhamdulillah in the USA each single year 50 thousand Americans they convert to Islam right? and Islam is the fastest growing faith you know I imagine that over here I was speaking um, in a meeting last night yesterday and I found out that Alhamdulillah they are close to a thousand and five hundred new Muslims over here in Norway and Islam is growing over here too so we have to also find out that we have a support system for them as soon as they come to Islam we have to give them spiritual support moral support physical support because some of their families when they find out that their children their family members became Muslim they may kick them out they may you know have all of those atrocities so we have to have that support system that counseling educational spiritual support system so all of these things inshallah is possible because Alhamdulillah Norway is one of the richest countries in the world all of you alhamdulillah hundred thousand people you are very blessed all of you have education you have wealth you have families we have numbers we have time we could combine all of these inshallah and we could become witnesses unto mankind last but not the least the challenges that we are facing my dear brothers and sisters in Islam it's not unique Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and all the anbiya who came before him may that be Nuh alaihi salam Ibrahim alaihi salam Musa alaihi salam Isa alaihi salam Daud alaihi salam all of them they faced similar problems and their companions and their progeny they also faced similar problems but they all overcame the challenges and the problems because they have two important ingredients especially Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his companions and those two important items that they had were the Quran which is unchanged and the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad 
Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in chapter 15, verse number 9, nahnu nazzalna zikra wa inna lahu la That it is Allah who has sent the zikr and He is protecting it. There are 11 million Hufaz in the world right now, alhamdulillah. There are zero Hufaz of the Bible. There are zero Hufaz of the New Testament. There are zero Hufaz of the Vedas and the Ramayana and the Krishna, right? There are zero. Alhamdulillah, we are blessed. The second blessing that we have now is the preserved Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His life, his details, what he used to do when he used to wake up in the morning, all throughout the day, how he established the economic system, the judiciary system, uh, the family system, the social system, the educational system, all of them are preserved. No other community are blessed with these two important things. So the people before us, alhamdulillah, they took these two things and they established the Islamic society. They conveyed the message of Islam. They overcome those challenges. And alhamdulillah, we have us with us those two important things. So let's pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he give us motivation, that he give us inspiration, that he give us unity. Despite all the differences, all the firqh, all of that we have, first and foremost, we are Muslims. That is the only label that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us in the Quran. In Surah 22, verse number 78, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that both before this and in this revelation, I have named you as Muslims, not as Wahhabis or Hanafis or Shafis or Salafis, Muslims, right? So we have to come to the common platform of the Quran and the Sunnah and Da'wah, leave aside all the differences. And if we do that, inshallah, we could, inshallah, Allah is going to give us the power and honor in this world peace and purpose in this world, solutions for all of humanity, but the best thing inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give to us would be Jannat al Fidos, paradise eternal in the hereafter. With that again, I do thank all of you and I thank the administration for giving me an opportunity to convey the, to remind ourselves about Islam and to have some action items so we could go home form committees, form groups, form organizations, and implement some of those, inshallah. With that, Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.